I'm John Sanford, and you should be watching The Crew Reviews. want to welcome the great John Sanford to the crew reviews. Hello, welcome good sir. Show, How are you? Fine, thank you. And we also would like to acknowledge that we have a guest host today. It's also from the uh, spending a lot of time in the Twin Cities, Mindy Mejia, author of four of her own books. The most recent one, Strike Me Down, is absolutely one of my favorite books of last year. So. Absolutely. Well, John, Ocean Prey is your 31st Lu Lucas Davenport novel, which is mind-blowing in itself. Can you give our audience a quick overview of what Lucas is in for this time around? Well, it starts out with, uh, with three Coast Guardsmen murdered when they try to stop a boat. And uh, the general consensus of what happened was, was that that boat off Fort Lauderdale was picking up dope that had been dumped off a reef. Uh, the Coast Guard can't find where the rest of the dope is, if there is any. The FBI is called in uh, and the Coast Guard is involved uh, looking for both the killers uh, and for the dope. Uh, they're not getting very far because of the FBI. And uh, so they ask uh, a, a U.S. senator who is a uh, senator from Florida and whose relatives are in the Coast Guard, officer, their Coast Guard officers, ask Lucas to take a look because Lucas has done some jobs for various U U.S. senators in the past books. Uh, so Lucas takes a look and uh, I don't wanna get into too much of what happens then because uh, there's, there's one major thing that I really kind of don't wanna give away, but uh, Lucas takes a look and eventually drags Virgil Flowers, another one of my heroes into the story. And uh, so they uh, get together and, and, and handle the case, uh, chasing down the killers and the drug dealers. Mm. It is a great book and I, love it. I won't spoil it either. Uh, but before we get further into the book, I want to talk just about Lucas because the Lucas Davenport we met in Rules of Prey is a vastly different man than the one in Ocean Prey. Um, beyond the professional changes from detective to the BCA to uh, the Marshal Service, he's matured in many areas, uh, remains set in his ways in others. But in my opinion, he has one of the richest character arcs of anybody in crime series fiction. Um, when he fell for weather, you know, Letty comes into his life, a couple of near-death experiences, bring him face-to-face -face with his own mortality. All of it has felt organic and authentic. But my question is, how much of Lucas's evolution is a reflection of John Sanford's evolution? And how much of it is just a natural outgrowth of trying to keep the character fresh? Actually, they're just uh, an outgrowth of the sequence of the books. Mm -hmm. When I started writing these, um, there were several characteristics that I gave to Lucas that are the same as, as I had, but basically that was because I didn't want to forget about them. So, <laughs> so he's about the same height as I am. And we both started out when we were 46. Well, I'm now 77 and he's 52. Wow. So what I've done in Lucas's case is I've slowed down the time flow, but in the background, uh, the time flow is the same. So there, uh, if, you, if you read the whole series from beginning to end, you'd find some weird things in it. In the, in the very first book, uh, in Rules of Prey, there's a moment toward the end of the book where uh, Davenport and, and a friend of his had just believed that they've cracked the case and they need desperately to get on a telephone. Well, they go to a telephone booth, but neither one of them has a quarter. So now <laughs> here we are in 2021, there are no phone booths. <laughs> Nobody needs a quarter. Uh, a quarter is almost useless now. Uh, yeah. and, and, and yet, it's in, in Davenport time, it's only been about six years. So, uh, so the background flows normally, but Lucas's age does not. Hmm. I wish I could age that slowly. <laughs> you, you, you feel like um, philosophically, as you've sort of changed as a person, that Lucas is some of that seeped into the character? 
Not very much. Um, I, I pretty much create the characters and uh, they don't, uh, uh, they, they do what I tell them. And, and I do not, uh, I don't really import much of myself into them. I mean, uh, since, since 1989, when I wrote the first book, I got divorced. I remarried the same woman who subsequently died of breast cancer. Uh, I married uh, again a few years later, an old friend of mine, somebody that I'd known since the middle ages. Uh, none of that happens to Davenport. Some of the anguish involved in, in in having a wife die, uh, some of the stuff that I learned about breast cancer, uh, some of that stuff uh, gets into the books. But uh, but Davenport does what I tell him. I, I don't, uh, you know, it's it's not really organic with me. Mm. Well, setting really plays a, such a strong central point in your novels. It's pretty obvious to all your fans, whether it's the Twin Cities, um, rural you know, Minnesota, and now he's broadened, uh, Lucas has broadened his horizons now as in the U.S. Marshals. So um, what drew you to the Miami area for this particular book uh, now that uh, we're looking at it to, with some fresh eyes? Well, the thing about Miami was that I was a newspaper reporter at the Miami Herald for about eight years. Mm. Um, Carl Hyacin, who was, I'm sure you know, was a good friend of mine, um, uh, we, and, and Carl just retired, as a matter of fact, as a, as a Miami Herald columnist, and I think he's done probably 30 books uh, in those years. Um, but, so I was familiar with the, the Miami area. Uh, I have a long history of covering crime there. Um, I, I knew a, a fairly large number of dirtbags, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, so, and so Miami was a natural place for me to go. I also sort of like, uh, I live in New Mexico now, but I sort of like hanging around Texas. So I've had a couple of books set in Texas now. And uh, I find Texas, Texas is really its own place. It's like a different nation entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of places, it's really crappy, but there's something very magnetic about it. It has the best music in the world. Oh, great. And, and so, uh, so, uh, I've, I've started including Texas in some of my books. I've just finished the first Letty Davenport book. I haven't quite finished it. Ooh. I, let me turn around here. Yeah. Is that what's coming up next? <laughs> I am in, I am in, I, 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 I swore on the memory of my mother that I would have this book in New York by Friday of this week. Actually, oh. I originally swore on the on, on the on the memory of my mother that I'd have it there early in the week. Now it's Friday. I think maybe it's going to be Monday, but this is it. And and I, I I've that. been editing it. I, I've just been just been pounding on it. This is like the third run through in the last three weeks. It's driving me crazy because I found a couple of logic problems that I. And, um, and so I have had to rewrite stuff and I've had to pull stuff apart, stick it back together, change names. Um, my wife uh, told me that I used the phrase a few approximately a thousand times. <laughs> so I did a search and replace on a few and I found out that I could get rid of most of them, but not all of them. So, so I, that's the kind of stuff I've been doing for the last two weeks. Wow. There you go, folks. That's I'm exciting. so excited about a Letty Ooh, book. Me too. Love that character. So is, is that coming out next then? Do you have a date for that yet? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't even know if they're going to buy it, to tell you the truth. I mean, oh, uh, they'll buy it. <laughs> I'll buy it. It's, a, it's, it's a pretty ugly book. And, and, I, and I'm worried about it in some ways because when I started it, it was not such a big deal as it is now. Mm. But uh, the thing is, is that what I'm writing about is a militia uh, wow. in El Paso that is virulently anti-immigrant. And mm. uh, mm. they decide to stop an immigrant caravan coming north of the border using violence if they need to. Wow. Um, and, and so I, I worry about it a little bit because I've been in the news so much. Right. And I don't think about that as being good publicity. I think about that as somebody saying, God, the guy's really a jerk. He's writing about this serious thing in a thriller novel. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, so. Uh, you might be shining some light on it too. So I think that goes both ways. 
I'm you not know, sure I'm shiny. I don't know if that's oh, my problem. Oh, I see. All right. You know, it's like I haven't read I'm it yet. Throwing dirt on it. I don't know. <laughs> gotcha. I want to get back to Ocean Prey here for just a second. Um, so Ocean Prey, it's billed as, as Lucas Davenport and Virgil Flowers novels. So in addition to being your 31st Davenport novel, this is not the 13th Virgil Flowers book. Most writers like hope to create one signature character that endures, but you have two. And I'm even leaving out the kid novels. So when you created Flowers, did you have a sense that this was going to be a multi-book character, a character that endures? Or, or was that somewhat of a surprise that, that he took off into such a signature character as well? Well, I'll tell you, uh, first of all, uh, when I got reviews for the early books, uh, a lot of people mentioned the fact that some of my, that, that I had a sense of humor, which is, you know, not supposed to be unusual, but I do. And I put it in my books. So there was plenty of stuff. In there. So uh, I decided that I might as well take advantage of that and write a character who was a little bit funny. And then the other thing that was going on is that I had a, a close group of friends in Minneapolis, some of whom you might know. Um, uh, Chuck Logan was one of them, Larry Millette's another one, uh, and there, there were just a bunch of them. Joe Souchere is one, and, mm -hmm. and what I did was I said, why don't we write books together? And uh, so, because most of these people were newspaper guys, and, and I was making reasonably decent money by that time, because all the books were on the bestseller list, and, and so what I did was I wrote, I believe, seven, the first seven Virgil Flowers novels were actually shared with friends of mine and, and you know, and it sort of helped them into retirement because, uh, you know, the newspaper retirement isn't the best thing in the world. So that was the original <laughs> impetus for, for the Virgil Flowers books. And also because it did give me a chance to kind of exercise my sense of humor. And, you know, the other thing about serious thriller novels like the, like the Davenport series, where they're, where they're somewhat intense, is that, um, is that, you don't really get to reflect the full stupidity of criminals. And, and, and the thing about Virgil was, is he sort of did get the, to, to show the, the real stupidity of flowers. I think of criminals in the, in the first book, uh, Virgil, uh, there's a thing mentioned in the first few pages that Virgil fired 17 shots at a guy uh, who was trying to hold up a, a, a gas station and a, a convenience store and didn't hit him. And the guy eventually surrendered and Virgil explained to somebody who asked him about it, like, you know, the guy, it's just the guy's job. You know, that's what he did for a living. He held up convenience stores and, and Virgil felt kind of sorry. He had a wife and kid to support. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so Virgil was gonna put him in prison, but he didn't feel, you know, all that good about it. Huh. Uh, and the woman said, you know, like, I think our guys would have killed him. And Virgil <laughs> said, you must have some mean guys here. So Virgil, dealt with a lot of stupid people. And and uh, and that allowed me to kind of let the humor out. So is that your primary, when, when you're sitting down to think about if you're gonna write the next Davenport book or the next Flowers book, is that your primary consideration of whether, you know, how much humor you wanna have in the story, how stupid the criminals should be? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's just, that, it's just that, that I covered crime a lot, um, usually, more from a feature than a, than a daily beat kind of thing. But uh, there, there's a lot of stuff you put in a Davenport book seems kind of out of place. Mm -hmm. For example, in one of the Flowers books, uh, a woman who is a private detective uh, angers another woman who throws a slice of pizza at her. And a hot pizza hits the woman's face and she can't get it off because it's melting cheese. And so now she's got a big burn on her face. Well, that's an actual thing. Uh, <laughs> I think in another Flowers book, I think it was in a Flowers book, uh, there's a story about a guy who was going around, uh, he would take pictures of his private parts, okay? He, he was a flasher, but he didn't want to get caught flashing people, so he'd take Polaroid shots of himself, and then he'd drop them on the floor, knowing that women could never pass a photograph without looking at it, a dropped <laughs> photograph. So they would pick it up and look at it, and he'd be sitting 15 feet away watching them so that he'd get the thrill without the arrest. Jeez. And um, so I wrote that because I kind of heard something like that. And about a week after the book came out, I got a call from a cop down on the Florida Keys, and he said, did you get that from down here? Because we got a guy doing that. <laughs> so, oh, so no. One of your fans. Oh, no. Yeah. 
<laughs> so so you get to put it in the flowers books i got to put in a lot of that really weird crap that that uh, that, that these strange people do wow but true <laughs> john aside from lucas and virgil you've created a menagerie of characters who readers have come to know well um, from early on with Sloan and Del Capslock to Weather and Letty to Bob and Ray to more familiar faces showing up pretty much each book. Um, I don't want to give any spoilers, but there, there are scenes that are very emotional as a reader uh, and affect you as a reader. And there are scenes in, in where is it? Uh, Ocean Prey that affected me as a reader. And I'm wondering as a writer, when you're putting your characters through hell and an emotional experience, do you have that reaction? Because you've created these, these babies of yours and you've lived with them for so long. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I know what you're, I know what you're talking about. And, and, and the thing is, is that I talked about it with my editor. And, and, and okay. we talked about it, and I don't know if he was entirely happy with the idea of what I was proposing, mm. but I went ahead and did it anyway. The thing is, I feel like you got to slap the readers up, upside the head every once in a while just to keep their attention. And, they, and, and it sort of adds, I think, a long term for people who've read it for a long time. It adds an element of suspense. And uh, so, sure. so uh, that's why I do that kind of thing. I mean, we're not talking about it because it's sort of a, it's sort of, a, yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 It's an, it, yeah. It was very, very effective. Oh. very effective. You know, the thing about it, the thing about emotional scenes is, and that's what I've, I've got a problem in this thing. <laughs> <It's new ready laughs> no. uh, you write a scene that, that is very intense and very heavy, and you find out that you didn't do it well enough the first time. So you go back to it, and you go back to it, and you go back to it. And, and um, uh, eventually, eventually it gets thick enough and heavy enough that, that it becomes effective. But the first time through, it might be pretty sketchy. Hmm. Well, I want to go back to something that Mindy mentioned earlier. Um, from a kind of a different perspective. Virgil emerges as a main character in 2007 and you've been balancing two main series, never really missing a beat because you've been releasing praise every single year. Um, while also finding time to also do science fiction and, and co-writing with your wife on the YA novels. Um, how did your daily uh, work routine and personal life change once you introduced the, um, the series with Virgil while still maintaining the same pace uh, with the prey novels. Well, you know, uh, you wind up spending a lot more time sitting typing, yeah. and, uh, and and it's really been an intense experience yeah. when I was doing two books a year. This year, I decided I'd only do one. I was only going to do Ocean Prey, mm. and then my agent said something to the effect of, "Well, what are you going to do the Letty book you've been talking about all the time?" <laughs> So I started the Letty book last summer, and uh, as I was doing Ocean Pride, I didn't finish Ocean Pride until December, um, I started the Letty book and uh, just kind of working on it on the side. And then as soon as I finished this, within a week, I was back in the chair, um, you know, pounding on the, on the Letty book. And I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm just finishing it now. Wow. So, so it got very intense. When I was writing only one book a year, I actually spent... 15 years, I sponsored an archaeological dig in Israel uh, at a place called Tel Rehov, and I spent 15 years digging there, and that's the kind of thing I could do when I only was doing one book a year. Hmm. I can't do that now. I, 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 I just, uh, you know, I'm writing almost every day. Wow. It's amazing. <laughs> well, you know, I think Stephen King has said that he budgets 2,000 words a day and he doesn't miss. Mm. So I mean I, I can't do that. I mean that, oh, that God. Yeah, really no. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, we had a guest um, recently, John, who uh, he, he does a lot of heavy planning ahead of time, but he said that it, it's not uncommon for him to do ten thousand word days. And now this is this is a guy who is more than a writer. He's he's an inventor. He uh, he's been on Shark Week. He's he does he works with Elon Musk on on, on technical stuff, but he occasionally with ten thousand more day, and we all decide right then and there to hate him. So, uh, <laughs> well, I can't. Uh, I don't think I can type that fast. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think I can type that fast, and and uh, so I couldn't do that. Yeah. Fifteen hundred words for me is a good solid day. 
Well, he he does he says he does use um a, a really good speech to text program, so, but still for me that's almost harder because you're holding it in your head at the same time. So I don't know. It's it's just fascinating to hear what everybody does on a given yeah. day. Yeah. Well, I I actually think that I uh, the, the words come out through the typewriter somehow through mm -hmm. the through the keyboard, yes. and uh, and so I have to type. I, I thought about trying that dragon speech thing, right? But but I have a feeling that uh, that I'd really suck at it. Yeah, <laughs> you almost have to grow up. You almost have to grow up with something like that. I think, oh. or be fifteen. Yeah. So one of your strengths, and when you're when you are typing at the typewriter, is is in your novels is dialogue. Um, it's strong on the technical side because your cops sound like cops, your politicians sound like politicians, but it's also strong on wit, you know, the banter, the gallows humor that keeps uh, Lucas and the other characters sane. Can you offer any insights into how you approach dialogue when you're sitting down every day? I mean, any tips or tricks of the trade that, that you live by? I don't have any tricks. What I have was, uh, you know, that was I was a newspaper reporter from the time I was, you know, I, when I went in the army, they sent me to journalism school. And then I became an army reporter. And then after I got out, I was at the Miami Herald and I was at the, at the St. Paul newspapers. And, uh, and I listened to a lot of dialogue. I listened to people, I go to court cases and I would write down what people said. And then every day, I wasn't an editor, I was an editor for about two years. Uh, of the whole 25 years I was reporting and, and I would write down what people said every day. And I, and I really think that people have a voice and that if you, if you, if you rewrite what they say as a reporter, try to make it uh, clearer or better, uh, you often uh, take their voice away from them. So I tried to get it down accurately, uh, exactly what they said. And I screwed up. But, you know, basically that's what I tried to do. So I think I have those kinds of, that kind of dialogue flowing through my head. Sometimes when, I, when you write, uh, you have to go back and clean up sentences and s so they no longer sound quite conversational because they get too knotted up that way. And so then you have to clean it up a little bit, but you can always leave a flavor of it in there by, by with some strange structures and stuff and some ellipses where people just stop and they don't know what to say next and uh hmm. well john we have a we have a bunch of writers that um that watch our show i mean we have readers and writers and uh, mindy actually ha gave us one of our favorite tips when it comes to dialogue she when she wants to learn a new character what do you do mindy what do you first learn about that character oh i learn how they curse You're if, if I know what you say when you hit your thumb with a hammer, I know a lot about you already. <laughs> that, uh, you know, the thing is that those, uh, that, that, that cursing is a, is, a, uh, is a very strong punctuation. And I just went through this new book with Letty and found out that five different characters were saying Jesus. And, <laughs> and it's not right because people don't say that very much. Right. And, and so that I had to eliminate it from like three characters and put other stuff in there. Hmm. And I was actually thinking about going online and trying to find a, a list of, of exclamations that I could use for uh, <laughs> you know, to replace the Jesuses, but I didn't find them. There, so. <laughs> I've, I've done that with hell. Like too too many characters used hell. I'm like one of you can only one can own hell. Well, we got to figure out who's got hell. Yeah. <laughs> well, I th I th it's funny because when you said that, I remember we all laughed. You know, at, at that thought. But I, as I've gotten away from our show. It's exactly true, John. You people's voices are are very distinctly different, and my friends all curse differently than yep. each other. My Jersey friends, they curse. You know, they have their own <laughs> thing. You know, it's like a sailor, <laughs> and it's uh, way more extreme than uh, um, than mine is. But uh, then our Hoosier, my Hoosier friends, curse in certain ways. Well, I've had people say "Holy cats," and I, and I don't know if people say that anymore. Uh, you know, but but you start to run out of stuff for them to, you know, exclamation. We were talking about people being murdered and, and, and you know, terrible things happening. So you'd think there'd be a few exclamations, but I mean, you know, when you're, when they start to ring in the book, you got to get rid of some. Yeah, true. I like Holy Cats. I want to bring Holy Cats back. Holy Cats. We're bringing it. That's <laughs> bring holy title. The place I got that once was that I was playing golf with a friend and I, and I, I was trying to hit the ball as hard as I could. I hit it. I just, it was an enormous slice. 
And the guy who was uh, one of the guys I was playing with, who I didn't even know, kind of ran halfway off the tee and he was yelling, holy cats, that's the biggest place I've ever seen, <laughs> holy cats. And I just stuck in my head, holy cats, all right, you know. I love it. We have an inside joke in my family because when I was a little boy, my older brother had his friend over and I couldn't stand his friend. He was a bully. And um, I started to say, I hate you. Of course, I'm, you know, four or five. And then I wanted to call him a pig. But what I ended up saying was, I hate your pig. <laughs> so so our family, that that was a, a running joke in our family. When we were really serious about something, we'd say, I hate your pig. And okay, we're getting I mean, t-shirts of that. <laughs> I, may, I may steal that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Please do. John, I don't know if you remember this, but I happened to get a chance to talk to you at Thriller Fest way back in 2019 when people were still allowed to talk to each other in person. Um, <laughs> and I can tell you honestly, it was one of the most meaningful conversations I had there because I expressed my concern about getting a late start as a novelist. And you point out that you published your first novel at 47. And now here we are 50 books later. Um, but what I'm curious about is when in your life did you know that you wanted to eventually write fiction and what was the catalyst for making you take the leap when you finally did? Well, uh, I always sort of wanted to write fiction. I mean, I went to, uh, I, I had a weird reason for it, but I went to the Iowa Writers Workshop at the University of Iowa where I, where I kind of picked up the urge to write fiction. Um, and, and so, um, it's, it was always sort of there in the background. And, and as, a, as the kind of reporting I did, uh, I just had a lot of material, just all kinds of material stuck away in my head. Then uh, in 1986, I won a Pulitzer for reporting. And uh, when I won the Pulitzer, you know, there's a tendency in the newspaper business to think if you win a Pulitzer, you're set for life. Well, they gave me a $50 a week raise, which is <laughs> it's like uh, 2,500 bucks a year. Wow. And, 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 uh, and the fact is, is that I had uh, two kids and a wife, all of who wanted to go to college at the same time. And Ooh. so my original impetus was to make money. And, uh, and so the first book I wrote, which was a, a kid novel, um, I got $15,000 for, uh, and that wasn't going to work. Um, and so then I talked to my agent for who gave me a little pep talk at about 10 minutes told me what I had to do for the next book, which was, which was Rules of Prey, which eventually over the period of about six months yielded around 800,000. So that was like 12 years of newspaper reporting. <laughs> you sort of opened your eyes to the possibilities. Yeah, no kidding. Hmm. Very uh, practical reason. Prior to, well, and you just kind of briefly mentioned this, prior to your career as a novelist, you, you had a distinguished career as a journalist, obviously, with the Pulitzer we mentioned before. And as someone like myself, who comes from an Iowa farm family, you wrote a series near and dear to my heart, the 1985 titled Life on the Land, an American farm family, for which you right. wrote the Pulitzer. Can, and you, you kind of briefly described that it didn't really change much in the way of your journalist you know, aspirations, but do you think winning the Pulitzer changed the way you looked at like how you were going to approach your novelist career? Did it have any impact whatsoever on your, on your novel? Yeah, maybe decide I wanted one. <laughs> you know, <laughs> after, after getting a after getting a twenty five hundred dollar a year uh, raise for winning the Pulitzer, I decided maybe I better find something else. Okay. Uh, I by the way, I lived on Iowa farms for. Uh, seven years or something like that yeah yep and uh and outside of cedar rapids and and uh and so i've i've got a great fondness for iowa my brother still lives there yep. uh, i've had virgil go down there several times i've had some strange things happen in iowa yeah and, and i actually got to stick the iowa state fair into one of my virgil uh, one of my uh uh lucas davenport books i spent a lot of summers at those i know yep <laughs> So uh, talking about your career trajectory, knowing what it takes to complete a novel, it's extraordinary that you've completed over 50. I mean, you could have decided a long time ago after the kids and the wife got their degrees, you know, that you, you could rest on your laurels, um, but your output has actually increased over the years. What draws you to that keyboard still? And do you still get the same thrill from typing the end after all of you, all that you've already accomplished. You know, I, I really don't want to discourage people from doing this, but the fact is I'm a professional writer. 
So I, I'm not sure how ever thrilled I was. I was I was really kind of thrilled by the sales. I was thrilled by getting on the bestseller list. Um, uh, I was, you know, I was thrilled by winning a Pulitzer. But uh, I'm a professional writer, and so in some way, kind of a sneaky, rotten way, you think this is what I deserve. Um, you know, this, you know, because I work really hard, and so I really just. But you know, oh, I mean, you know, just from going to the to the convention there in New York. You know that there are a lot of people who are extremely good writers and right. and who don't sell well, and uh, and you can't really explain it. And I one of my explanations for the reason that I did so well was was with rules of prey. Uh, one of the PR people got to a friend at the Wall Street Journal, and the Wall Street Journal, which is a a, a newspaper that I do not like. The Wall Street Journal did a very long and kind and glowing review of my book. And that first book nearly made the bestseller list purely because of a piece of, of, of luck. Mm. And, 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 and luck is really critical at the beginning of a career. And uh, uh, so, so I, I, there, are, there are all kinds of things that happen when you're writing. Luck is important. And, and, uh, and as you know, from going to the Thriller Fest, there are, I mean, I'm a big Thriller fan and I probably read 50 books a year, 50 thrillers a year, one a week. Actually, I'm reading Stephen King right now. Yeah. I'm reading uh, uh, later. I, and and uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I read Stephen King's Institute uh, not long ago and the first section of that book is one of the best pieces of writing I have encountered in a long time. And wow. it just, it's just a pretty amazing piece of writing. Um, but but uh, I read constantly and there are so many good writers around. I mean, it's just, I mean, I, I, I could spend the rest of my life reading instead of writing it and really enjoy myself. Yeah. Well, we, we feel the same way because we, every week we interview, you know, uh, folks and sometimes we discover new, new authors that yeah. we, we didn't know who we, we can't believe are twice or three times as bigger than they already are. You know, there's some really, really great English writers right now hmm. and uh, some British writers and uh, who are doing thriller work. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I just really... I'm just really a fan of the genre. And you know, that's, I think that was another important thing in my becoming a writer to begin with, because I've always read them. Uh, going back to, uh, going back to like, uh, uh, well, all of those early guys um, and, and, you know, Travis McGee and, and uh, you know, the busted flush. And right. so that's the boat that he won in a, in a, in a card game. And, and, uh, <laughs> uh you know, Nero Wolf. I, I mean, it's it just, uh, I mean, I, I go all the way back there and I've read them all of my life. And my first wife loved those kinds of books. And so they were always in the family. And that, uh... Yeah. Well, John, you, you actually survived what we call the, the main part of the uh, program, um, which is the normal sort of questions. Um, we like to end the program or the last part of the program, I should say, with what we call the lightning round, which is a little bit more of a little bit more fun questions, a little bit more light, lighthearted questions and completely random at times. <laughs> um, we will each ask you three of those questions. There's no pressure. There's no wrong answers. Uh, I, I usually say that, you know, your mom always says speak you, 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 where most of us are raised with mothers that say think before you speak. And this is the portion of the show where you can you can or you don't have to. Um, <laughs> But That's my first problem with me, really. <laughs> <laughs> my first question, and again, um, I may have missed it, but is this the first novel, Virgil novel, not to include that fucking flowers? Oh my god! Uh, uh, it may be. I mean, I, <laughs> that that didn't occur to me until right now. It's so funny. I, I I once had three middle aged women from Wisconsin show up at my one of my signings with t-shirts and said that fucking flowers on. <laughs> I the from the very first time I read that line I absolutely loved that line and it was funny I was I was f finishing this book and at the end I was like you know what I have to go back through but I don't I don't think he said that fucking flowers anytime in this book so uh, you know if I could cool. find if I could find that uh if I could find that book on my screen here 
I could probably do a quick search. Man, I, 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 <laughs> okay. I, I kind of don't think it's in there. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't think it is either. All but right, fun course. stuff. Okay, now this question is not a critique of either of these two things, but there have been two adaptations of your books um, with Mark Harmon and Eric LaSalle both playing your character. Putting aside anything about those two characters, if you could choose an actor, living or dead, to inhabit Lucas on, let's say a television show like Bosch, if they did a, a Davenport um, where you were you know, learning, the, you were, got to watch the character over a long period of time, who, who would you pick? Uh, I don't know, uh, Russell Crowe. Oh, oh I but, of that. you know, the guy that I think looks most like Davenport isn't an actor. It was that basketball coach for the Miami Heat for a long time. Oh, um, he was um, he he was a New York coach for a long time. Um, come on, yes. come on. Not Riley? Yeah, Riley. Yeah, Riley. Yeah, Riley. But that's what Davenport looks like. He'd there wear you. those plutonium suits and those $10,000 neckties <laughs> and he'd be walking up and down the sidelines going like this, you know, and, and that's what... That's an right oh. there. Which, by the way, this is an aside, but one of the other things I loved about this book was uh, a discussion about clothing and and Lucas, who always has been on the leading edge of clothing. I love that scene. That, that was a great sort of illustration of where, Lu where, where Lucas is in his life. Um, that whole discussion about fashion and when he was, when somebody um, inferred that he wasn't fashion forward anymore. Right, because he's not wearing a bolo tie. <laughs> it's a great offense. Yeah. That's sort of an in-joke around Santa Fe. I mean, you know, like there are a lot of people wear bolo ties yes. here. I, I told my wife if she ever caught me in a bolo tie, she's supposed to shoot me in the head. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned Santa Fe. And my, my final question uh, is, what is the best margarita in or around Santa Fe? I really couldn't tell you. Uh, I usually go into the places here if I'm going to have a margarita, which I do fairly frequently, and just say, give me the house margarita. Uh, and and uh, I'm not really a connoisseur of that kind of thing. I drink very little. Um, I mean, I drink, I probably have one drink a month. And uh, and I can't tolerate wine. I just don't like the taste of it. Mm. And uh, so, so I'm not a drinker. And I'm not a smoker anymore. And uh, so... Well, let me tell you where that question came from. I, I used to live in Albuquerque a long time ago when I first got married, just briefly. And I asked David Morrell the same question, by the way. Um, but in Madrid, that little town that you... Right. Yeah. There's a place called the... Mine, South of Santa Fe. Yes. There's a place yeah. called the Mineshaft Tavern. Yes. Which uh, Mr. Morrell and I both agree is the best margarita either of us have ever had. So if you mm -hmm. ever wander through Madrid and, and get thirsty, that's... I stand by it. <laughs> okay well you know there's a um there's a song called uh no i don't want to go there it's um the chili parlor bar and by guy clark and uh he talks about um he talks about uh what essentially is a margarita there and apparently at the chili bar parlor bar and i believe it's in austin uh they're supposed to have an extraordinary list of margaritas and if i ever get there i will probably try it <laughs> All right, Mindy, All right, Mindy, you're up. Okay. Now I had to ask you a couple of Minnesota questions, even though I know you're not in Minnesota currently. For the best, Juicy Lucy, do you go to the Five Eight Club or to Matt's Bar? No, say that again because I'm not quite clear about what you just said. So to get the best Juicy Lucy, would you go to the Five Eight Club or to Matt's Bar? I don't know. <laughs> you don't want to <laughs> He goes to both. <laughs> both, okay. Both. All right. Good. We ask him. We're asking him too many drinking questions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the juicy Lucy. It's a hamburger that has the oh, inside the burger. Yeah, it's, it's oh. not a drink. Don't drink it. No. <laughs> and also, I'm a vegetarian. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so no, don't go to neither of them. Okay. So, so at least since I married my second wife, I'm a vegetarian. Oh, okay. 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 I haven't had uh, meat in. 11 years, wow. except chicken. That Does that count? They, they deserve it. I don't know. <laughs> I figure they're, they're sort of like lizards, so it's okay. <laughs> they're dinosaurs, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so if you were gonna uh, vacation at the shore in Minnesota, would you go to Lake Minnetonka or the North Shore? North Shore. 
no question about it. Mm -hmm. The North Shore of Minnesota would be one of the great cruising areas of the world, of the entire world, if the water wasn't 55 degrees. You can't go swimming in it without without dying of hypothermia. Yeah. <laughs> but it is gorgeous. It's deep. It's fresh water. Uh, I mean, you know, if if it was warm water, I would have had a sailboat there forever. Mm. I wholeheartedly agree. That's... And then final question. I know you are also an art lover. So hypothetical, your friend gives you the chance to buy one painting of your choice from his private collection. Do you choose the Warhol, the O'Keefe, or the Rothko? The Rothko. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things you're not allowed to do in New Mexico is say anything about George O'Keefe. Um, and I'm, my feeling is I don't like her very much. Um, she, uh, she's a great modernist. Um, she was a great icon for a long time. Uh, my wife loves her work. She would kill for uh, an O'Keefe. We've got an O'Keefe museum here, uh, but, uh, but she has not been somebody I can get around. One of the things that I once heard somebody say to her is that her works look best the smaller that they're, they're, they're pictured and that her natural media would be a postage stamp. And that's sort of where I'm at with that. But this is not, this is not, uh, th th this has nothing to do with women or anything else. It has to do with their actual art. I think that Frida Kahlo, who painted almost at exactly the same time as her, I think she's a brilliant painter. I love her yeah, painting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so would you choose the Rothko or the Kahlo? Pardon me? The Rothko. So, so follow-up yeah. question. If, if your friends had a Kahlo, would, 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 would you take would, the Rothko? It would depend on it would depend on what the actual painting was, and uh, the problem with Rothko paintings sure, sure. now, the problem with Rothko paintings now is many of them are fading out and the colors are changing rather drastically because he was not a good chemist, and so some of his paintings are virtually gone now. Ooh, uh -huh. I probably would pick the Frida. Hmm. In that case, keep him around. All right, here we go. Last but not least, me. All right, so. What is it about folks who are born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, guys like you and I, that make us so damn handsome and successful in life? Was Quaker Oats? It's, it's just Quaker? luck. No, I think it's just luck. Just luck? You know, I thought... it's, it's luck and genes. That's all. Yeah. And, you know. and, uh, I mean, you know, I mean, I know it's kind of a burden we got to carry with us, but, you know, what can you say? It, it's definitely <laughs> held me back. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was Quaker Oats dumping a bunch of chemicals into the river, but, you know. No, I don't like to think about that. It could be, though. <laughs> All right. I, I once almost drowned in that river, by the Did way. Did you down really? By, down by Quaker Roach. The know? Cedar River? Yeah. I was fit. There's a, there's a, you know, the dam in the Cedar yeah, River? Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, there's an apron off of it. And I was fishing for catfish downstream from it. And I kept walking a little bit further downstream. I didn't know there was an apron there. And I stepped off of it into about 15 feet of water. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, and I was just, uh, it scared the hell out of me. Anyway. Wow. All right. Okay. Number two, have you ever eaten at the Maid Right in Marshalltown, Iowa? No, I have not. But I will tell you that I have done in Marshalltown. I illegally imported about a, imported about a thousand Marshalltown trowels, which are made in Marshalltown, <laughs> into Israel. Oh, because they're really? the only kind that they really want to use on archaeological digs there. Wow, I can't even imagine all the smokes. All right, and here's the last question. Have you golfed your age yet? No, no. I have only I have only shot in the 70s a half a dozen times in my life. And uh, last year uh, up in Iowa on I-35 uh, south mm -hmm. of the Minnesota line, I fell off my truck. Oh. I pulled over to the side of the road to push a canoe up on top. I fell off the truck backwards into a ditch and I broke my arm uh, right here. And uh, uh, I, ha I can't swing a golf club, probably not until this summer. And uh, the interesting thing about it was, was that I went, after I broke my arm, I managed to tie the boat down a little bit. I went up to the next exit where there was a convenience store. And I asked the woman uh, where the nearest hospital was and she didn't know. <laughs> I don't know. 
And uh, I wound up calling my sister who was a nurse and she got online and she looked up the nearest hospital. I had to drive about 40 miles to an emergency room. Oh, and the God. thing is, this is right on I-35. And when I got there, they said, you know, if you could hurt yourself bad in Iowa now, the way things have shaken out in the economy and everything, you're pretty much on your own. You're wow. gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna have a drive. And, uh, Lord. So, that's crazy. I'm glad you survived that. Yeah, well, I mean, it was weird. Yeah. And uh, it didn't hurt me very much, but it, it was my arm didn't work. It was going like this. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you weren't driving a stick. Yeah, that was <laughs> good. Be. That'd be good. Actually, I was driving a pickup, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, John, we have been thrilled to have you on the show tonight. Um, this is a great book, and I, I like to call it casual excellence. I, 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 that's how I describe you and Michael Conley. It just seems like, yeah, man, another excellent book from yeah. Mr. Stanford. And another bestseller, I know, you know. I know that's a terrible thing to do because it, it, I know all the work that goes into it, but uh, I honestly have never been disappointed by one of your books, and uh that's why I've been reading them since 1989 when I was 19. So thanks well, for you got to work hard to be casual. Michael yeah. Connolly, by the way, I'm a big fan of his. He's, he is one of the best uh, uh, mystery and thriller writers out there. Well, you're, you're up there too much. Yeah, you're right there with him. That's for sure. <clears throat> Mount Rushmore, a crime novelist. You're both on it. So yep. uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. We, we appreciate you coming on the show and um, we'll get the word out on this book. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. See ya. Yep. Nice talking to you. Well, big thanks to John Sanford, and we are all excited for Ocean Prey to launch next week. Mm -hmm. Check out the crew reviews every Monday, where we will have a new guest interview, and that's it. That's it? <laughs> that's perfect. One take? You're not allowed to do that as a guest host. <laughs> You're not allowed. <laughs> I'm not allowed? No, I'm not allowed. Right, you're allowed. Great job. There is no scripts, whatever you want to say. I can't do it if there's no scripts. No. And All you have to do is say, you know, like, um, great tonight, um, talk to Mr. Stanford, whatever. Uh, check us check us out every Monday on the crew reviews and um, uh, whatever, you know, it, it, any version of that. Okay. And if you mess up, it goes on the blooper reel. Ocean Prey, Ocean <laughs> Prey. <laughs> yeah, we, when we first started this, we, we like, tried to get perfection on the out, outro and then we realized it's so it's much better it's more fun when it's not you know yes, it's it is and we were drinking so that usually helped a lot yes